Morning, everyone. Hey, Mike. Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, I'm Maren Lead, here, a senior advisor here at the Center for Strategic and International Studies uh, in the International Security Program and the Harold Brown Chair in Defense Policy Studies. Um, I'm really grateful to all of you for taking the time to spend the day with us today. Um, I assume that almost everybody here, uh, to varying degrees of directness, is engaged in the S&T enterprise, the science and technology enterprise to some extent. Um, and that the greatest satisfaction in being part of that enterprise is in uh, successfully delivering new capabilities to users. Um, that can be a very long and complex process. There's uh, all kinds of long standing, standing conversations about the trials and tribulations of the, of the path from conception to ideally delivery um, from the valleys of funding death to de depending on how far upstream you want to go with the STEM workforce issues, et cetera, et cetera. But one crucial element of that is being able to, to develop and sustain the requisite support um, and in the government context frequently from non-technical policymakers um, to continue those activities that ultimately result in the delivery of that capability. And so it's that specific element of the process of uh, finding ways to communicate uh, to a whole variety of stakeholders the potential um, and, and to do that persuasively and repeatedly and on a sustained basis that we wanted to focus on today. Um, and then so to, we've, we've brought together a variety of people to offer their perspectives on that front, and then we'd like to involve you all in that continued conversation and breakout sessions this afternoon, um, and ultimately, hopefully, uh, leave at the end of the day with some specific ideas that we might collectively take forward uh, to strengthen the overall science and technology enterprise. Um, so we are gonna start with a conversation uh, with Ben Riley from the Office of the Secretary of Defense, and we'll have two panels uh, to get into some more in-depth perspectives, and then a lunchtime speaker before we ask you all to go do a little work on your own, uh, and then come back and talk again uh, as a group at the end of the day. So uh, we're very much looking forward to, hopefully, what will be a very fruitful uh, discussion that sparks a lot of ideas and exchange, and that You'll also walk out of here with uh, potentially new networks and, uh, and continue this conversation long after today amongst yourselves and with others. Um, so that's the point of the day. We are exceptionally grateful to DuPont that uh, allowed us to pull this all together. Um, and um, they've been very generous with their support, not only for this, for some other things we've done as well. Uh, so. We're thankful to them. Um, just a couple of admin notes. If people could turn off their ringers, we'd appreciate it. Um, and also for later in the day, I think hopefully you all were told about your secret numbers on your name tags, which will have is, is our little code for where you go this afternoon. We'll get into that later. But um, uh, with that, I think we'll dive in. Um, very pleased to be here this morning with. Uh, ben Riley, who is the principal, <coughs> the principal deputy to the Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Emerging Capability and Prototyping in the Undersecretary of Defense uh, Acquisition Technology and Logistics. Um, this latest uh, iteration of the Phoenix of Ben is uh, the, a series, um, the latest in a series of positions that he's held um, in the uh, in at &L to help try to facilitate um, and foster creative approaches to warfighting challenges um, by leveraging um, and understanding trends in commercial markets, uh, in universities, in academia, in, um, and in the Defense Department Research and Development Enterprise. Um, he began his career as a 
a flight officer in the P3 community, uh, and he held a number of command positions and staff positions as an, uh, before retiring as a captain. And um, he has been, I think, throughout his career, a, a strong advocate not only for uh, applying the hard sciences to military problems, but also uh, social sciences as well, um, and integrating those things to, again, deliver meaningful advances to, uh, to military personnel um, over both uh, 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 the long and short term. So he's going to talk to us a little bit about his perspectives on best practices for building support for those kinds of activities, um, and also potentially some areas where he thinks uh, greater attention in the s and community might be warranted. So Ben, thanks for coming this morning. And we look forward thanks. to the conversation. Thanks, Maren. Uh, Maren and I, and I see J.D. McQuarrie from Georgia Tech Research Institute, are all involved in a project right now uh, that I have, have a meeting on at <laughs> midday uh, called, um, what's the name? Dynamic Sh Spectrum Sharing Consortium. And, and by way of background, we had um, a couple years ago, um, and you were on the panel, right, J.D., the President's Council on Science and Technology, uh, did a study on the future of the electromagnetic spectrum and one of the things that came out of that was, um, was um, a recommendation to sell 1,000 megahertz of spectrum to stimulate economic development, and I believe 500 have been sold to date. Um, and so one of the panel members came to me, and he was advocating the development of a spectrum sharing test bed in an urban environment. And where we are, we've been able in the past to sort of fund a number of little programs to stimulate an idea what I call stir the pot. And, uh, and so th he was hitting me up for some money to start this, the groundwork for this consortium or this, this test bed. And as we talked, I said, why don't we think about the idea of a consortium of companies, uh, both large and small, who do things in the electromagnetic spectrum uh, that DOD could work with so we don't go out and, and necessarily contract with a single company, we contract with the consortium and thereby, there, therefore we contract with the companies within the consortium. My, my big objective in, in recommending this was the question of how do I find those talented companies who are out there in industry who either have no history of doing business with DOD, find it hard to do, uh, or, or we don't know about it. And in my experience, there are more companies out there like that across a range of disciplines than, than we can possibly get our hands on. There's not, not a process you can lay in place. And so we've been working on that idea, but it's, it's basically how do we leverage, how do we get our hands on, on some of this technology? And we've had a number of, and, and it's gone, the idea of setting up this consortium has gone, quite frankly, a lot smoother uh, within the bureaucracy than I thought it would go. Uh, but uh, we we have a number of still uh, issues, you know. Well, we don't need to worry about this, and and a lot of people throughout the Pentagon, when you talk about the spectrum and where it is and where it's going, really don't see it as an issue yet. So um, it's it's kind of been an uphill battle, and we have to continue to talk about it. But uh, it's also been an interesting process. And actually, we're going to have an industry day what on the fifth next month. So. Uh, uh, Marin, Marin approached me on talking about this, and I thought, first of all, I thought it's a really hard problem to talk about uh, because a couple of years ago I asked a professor in a university in the area, you know, hey, what do you, do you have any way to justif that we can really justify or articulate why it's important for us to spend money on, on science and technology research and development? And he gave me this answer that was probably 30 pages. Um, that probably could not be read by mere mortals. Uh, very, very complex um, and not the kind of thing you're going to articulate to an individual in a bureaucracy who says, hey, I got 10 minutes for this, I, ne I need the elevator speech, and, and go on. Uh, the, the other thing is the initial reaction is when people say, okay, talk about the value of technology. Uh, they, one of the first things people drag out is the DARPA experience with the Internet. Or um, an experience I had is GPS, and and those are all kind of after the fact 
uh, examples of why technology is good. The real challenge is talking about why you need to do this before you build whatever the system is that the, the technology will, will spur. Uh, I have an article somebody sent me just the other day on, on the iPhone and all of the DOD investments that related it to, that, the, that contributed to components in the iPhone. And I thought about throwing it up here as an example and decided it's too, too simplistic. But, but I think, um, and, and the same with many of these other things. Certainly I doubt any of, any of the developers of the internet, and I know the developers of, the GP, of GPS, ever envisioned what those things would become. And not only within the military, but throughout, in, throughout the world. Um, I, I've spent roughly 20 years on and off inside the Pentagon, uh, big place, and you know, you walk down the halls from building uh, Office A to Office B or wherever, and you, of, you often hear, not, not eavesdropping, but just hear conversations with people in the hallway, and, and, you'll, and more than once, many times, in fact, I've, I come across a group of people, they could be military folks, they could be government civilians, or they could be uh, contractors uh, in the building, uh, who obviously have been in giving a pitch to somebody on their idea of a, some system or capability. And, and uh, some of the words I hear often, well, they just didn't get it, or they don't understand it, or if only they had listened, and any other number of rationalizations like that. So it's not hard, there's a, there's a certain set of, there's probably, you know, 10 basic kinds of conversations that one can hear in the hallways as you walk around. and that. That, that frustration after failing to articulate why their program is important or why it should be considered is, is often one that we see, uh, I see. Um, one, one, as I thought about this, one of the takeaways that I have in, in terms of talking about technology is, is, is not just the technology. I, I have a steady stream of people coming in to show me some brand new capability or technology. And sometimes they walk in and we'll put it on the table or put a picture of it on the table and say, this is a disruptive technology. And I, I told Marin before, I look at the technology and the technology looks at me and nothing happens. Um, uh, You're not disrupted. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not disrupted. <laughs> Sorry? I, that, somebody will come in and say, I, this is a disruptive technology. And, and they just put it in front of me. like. This is a disruptive technology. And I, I tell people, I look at the technology and the technology looks back at me and nothing happens. Um, <laughs> kind of like taking a horse you know, to, to water and saying drink, and you look at the horse and the horse looks at you and nobody drinks any water. So it, it becomes important to me to put that technology within a context. How might I use this thing? How might I employ it? Uh, what, what would be the potential application? Uh, and that could either be a piece of hardware, a piece of software, or whatever. But, but if I can put whatever the technology is within a context of some sort, uh, either for a current issue or uh, I spend a lot of time trying to guess what I think is coming down the road in terms of things that we ought to be focused on, it, it, that technology becomes a lot more um, understandable to me and I can say, well, here's here's where it might fit, or here's where it might go, or it might, might augment this, or uh, whatever it, wherever it is. And I think, I think, so the first big thing I'd recommend if you go to the, in the working groups and all is, what's the context within this thing lies, whatever this technology is, not just put it on the table, and, uh, but you know, some understanding of what the military needs, some understanding of what the national security needs are, uh, some understanding of uh, where you think of the market, whichever, the, the, the sector of that technology comes out of, I think, is an important thing in, to think about. Um, the, the other thing I, I, I try to think about is, um, I, I sort of wrote down decomposition. People come in and talk about a technology and decomposition. And for me, it, it breaks down to a number of different things. First of all, it's not only the technology, which is probably something you can see sitting on the table, such as that glass, but also the science behind the technology. And I can think you need to think of what I'd call a continuum between the science that created that technology 
and, and the technology itself. It's not, it's not just one or the other, but it's a continuum of those things. And I think that the failure to think of that continuum often causes people to talk past each other. So the scientific community is talking about one thing, uh, the customer community is talking about another, and I think uh, they wind up talking past each other. And uh, I, I think, to me, the continuum then extends from the science research area through, uh, through the technology prototyping and development, through the system development and to an operational capability, and then, if appropriate, refreshing that capability over time. It's not just a... Um, a standalone thing. I think also that, you know, if many, most of you, I assume, are familiar with the, the, the discussion of disruptive innovation and sustaining innovation that comes out of uh, the innovator's dilemma. And I think the discussion on the value of the technology is much more difficult on, on the disruptive side than it is on the sustaining side. When you're sustaining, you already know what you have, you know what it is, you know what you want to improve, and so you have a much better context of whatever it is you're after. The disruptive side, when you put something in front of a person and say, this might do whatever, uh, I, I think is much more difficult to grasp. And, and our knowledge of the value of technology, I would assert, is a lot better after the fact than it is before the fact on many of these programs. And I think a, a lot of these issues have, have some degree or often a high degree of risk before you have um, developed, you know, developed the system, uh, which causes me uh, to favor, as we do prototyping and experimentation with things, lots of little programs where I can take a lot more risk, and if I fail, I'm not going to find myself on the front page of the newspaper, rather than a big program where I envision the end state before we, we've ever uh, cut the first piece of metal or whatever we've done to start that program. A, a couple of anecdotes uh, that, that might help to, to serve um, the afternoon session. I, one of my prized possessions at home, and I tell people I keep it under glass, a glass case, and say break in case of GAO audit, I hope my version of the GAO is here, is, is a 1983 report from the GAO on, on GPS. And as you might guess, the program was behind schedule and over cost. And it was an Air Force program, and the Air Force was arguing uh, the GPS was built, the system was built primarily for um, uh, large aircraft flying long distances. Um, the Air Force was also arguing during the GPS audit that the commercial aviation industry, airlines and the like, would be interested in this capability. And the GPS doubted they would because... Uh, GAO, I'm sorry, the GAO doubted they would because, um, you know, those kind of airplanes flew on established air routes with radio nav aids, tack ins VORs, and the like, and, and therefore they wouldn't need this kind of thing. Uh, so look at where we are today with GPS, which is, anybody here not have a GPS with them somewhere? You know, and, and so it's, it's, it's very difficult, I think, to envision not only uh, where the technology goes to solve whatever the purpose was, the original one in this case being large uh, cargo type airplanes, but also where it's going to go after that. So I keep that study around. In fact, um, we had a GAO audit once and I, I mentioned it to the team and um, they were actually very helpful to us and I said to them to kind of soften the blow, hey, you guys got some good ideas, um, can we sit down and talk to you about it? And so, but the second one is a Predator unmanned air vehicle, which I was involved in in, in the 90s. It was an ACTD. Uh, my boss at the time was Larry Lynn, who went on to be the head of DARPA. And as we walked around with that program, I probably could, uh, in retrospect, think of about five or six senior officers in the Pentagon who thought it was a good idea. And a lot of reasons why it wouldn't work, a lot of reasons why it was of no value and all of that. And, and it took persistence to get that thing going, and, and frankly, a lot of that came, I think, from the senior leadership in the, in the department. Um, Secretary Perry told us, uh, not me, but my boss told us to deploy this thing to Bosnia when we had U.S. forces in Bosnia, and um, the response to the secretary was, uh, it's not ready yet. He said, deploy it to Bosnia. But um, the, 
the, the, the reluctance to embrace this new idea of an unmanned air vehicle was, was pretty substantial at that time. Another incident involved that uh, we had started the uh, Advanced Concept Technology Demonstration Program, and uh, we were asked to come down and brief the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, which is the Vice Chairman and the Joint Staff and the Vice Chiefs of the Military Services on, on these programs we were doing, which included the Predator, the Global Hawk, uh, a number of precision fires things, uh, some, some radar that today is in the Navy 2D, um, uh, some combat, uh, co cooperative engagement capability. Uh, and, um, and so as we're getting ready to talk, one of the service vice chiefs is, uh, I guess he's talking to me and he said, well, the only reason we have a S&P program in our service is you guys in OSD make us have one. So if you're gonna t go talk technology with that guy, it's gonna be a real tough, tough road to hoe. Uh, one, one of the favorite programs that we sponsored in our office uh, uh, is one we did with Naval Research Lab. And, uh, and, and the genesis of the program was me uh, walking around the Pentagon and seeing lots of people studying fuel cells and the potential of fuel cells. And we studied and we studied and we studied and nothing seemed to me to come out of the studies. So I was over at the chemistry department at NRL in, across the river from National Airport, and I, I was talking to um, uh, the deputy of the chemistry department, and said, you know, I'd really like to do something with fuel cells. He says, well, we have this fuel cell we just got. It's uh, 83 watts, it's from Protonics, and uh, we, I said, well, what do you think? And he says, well, we thought we'd put it in an unmanned air vehicle and see if it would fly. And I said, okay, what would it take? And so we gave him probably, I don't recall, but say $200,000 to do this experiment. They had no fuel tank for the thing, so they had to get a paintball gun canister as a fuel tank for this hydrogen. They had no radiator, so they got a beer can and fashioned it into a radiator. It was, it was, a, it was a good beer. Uh, <laughs> um, and, uh, and they flew it for 43 minutes, and we said, geez, we look, then we looked at each other and said, what do we do, you know? And, and, and then a guy from the submarine community came along, and, and he was complaining uh, that um, submarines have unmanned air vehicles on them now. Many of them are gas powered, which means for safety reasons, those things are stored outside the hull of the ship, which means to, uh, to launch it or recover it, uh, the submarine has to surface, which as many of you know, or most of you know, no self-respecting submariner wants to do. And, and uh, so we said, so if, and we said, well, if we had a hydrogen fuel cell, the ship makes hydrogen as part of its atmospheric control, we could store the, the UAV inside the hull of the ship, and we could uh, y use the hydrogen that the ship discharges as fuel. So we, we started to do it, and um, uh, the, uh, we never used the fuel part, but as a, it was a gent at Naval Research Lab who was the UAV guy who said, well, I went home and worked the numbers, and it should fly. And, uh, and in last year, the Navy had, and it was released, the public release on, uh, on the successful launch of this vehicle from a, a torpedo tube. And the vehicle is extended from the torpedo tube. Now it's under the sponsorship of Office of Naval Research and others. The vehicle is uh, in a tomahawk, a missile canister, which is ejected from the tube, and it goes out to a point of launch. It goes vertical on, on ready for launch, the top flies off, pulls off of this thing, and the, um, the um, vehicle's pulled out of the um, canister by an electrical assist. The wings pop open. It's an X-wing kind of thing. And the uh, fuel cell lights off and away it flies. And instead of 43 minutes, now flies for a number of hours. And that same Cuban weight for that first 83-watt fuel cell is now, it was, it probably is more now, 550 watts of power. So it was this iterative thing, and uh, when we first started, uh, people, a lot of people kept telling us it'll never work, it won't work, um, and many, many things like that. So um, it, was, it was something that we could sort of see, uh, but the point was we certainly had no vision of where it was going to end up. We had a, a clear objective and to look at something like the utility of fuel cells, but no real vision of where it would end up. Uh, we just did a demo. Uh, 
uh, with the Army Research Lab uh, up in Adelphi, Maryland here, a, a networking of uh, sensors and fires. And, and the idea was we have a number of standalone sensors, and this sensor would report something back to um, you know, a, an operator, and this sensor would report something back to an operator. And what this demo did was to network these sensors. So this sensor gains contact on something. Um, there's an automatic slew of adjacent sensors into the area to confirm the contact. It goes to, it goes to a, uh, a watch officer who looks at it and can say, well, those are, those are bad guys, take it under fires, and whatever happens next. Um, the, the interesting thing to me as we did this experiment was it, it built on a whole legacy of earlier experiments. It wasn't something we just dreamed up and did. There are a whole series of experiments from different areas that uh, have taken place before that gave us the knowledge to, to move ahead to this next project. Um, where this fits into the Army doctrine and the Army concept, I really don't know if it does at all. Uh, but we have now a, uh, just yesterday we met on a series of small follow-on experiments that will focus on specific areas of, and topics in this to see if we can um, you know, do the capabilities. And I have a feeling uh, we have some specific applications in mind, but as it, as it grows and it sort of develops, I have a feeling that the app applications really come out of this that are in very different areas than we initially envisioned. Um, so the characteristics I see are unintended results. Um, there's certainly a reticence to accept new concepts such as the Predator UAV. Uh, once again, not a flash in the pan in each of these efforts uh, that, that I mentioned had some element of technical risk in them and, and, uh, and, and frankly in many cases difficulty in explaining to audiences uh, both within the Pentagon, uh, in, in, on the Hill, many times in industry, what exactly we were trying to get out of it. In my view, if, if somebody comes in with an idea and gives a brief, say a PowerPoint presentation on a new concept or a new idea, to an audience of 100 people, in my view, there'll be about two people in the room who will get it. And, and you can usually look at their eyes and see the head shaking of those who get it and the rest of the guys look and say, what, what's this guy talking about? Uh, and, and, and so I think the value in these small demonstrations that I, I referenced is you, you do these iteratively and you get whatever the concept is to a point where people can see it and touch it and smell it and do whatever with it, turn knobs on it. And once it becomes a tangible thing, in my experience, once it becomes something that people can really see, they st ideas start to flow. And, and when the, the moment, if you, if you take one of these and so you like a glass here and say, oh, could you put water in it? Once they st the, the audience, the potential user audience starts making suggestions on applications, I think you have them with the technology. Um, if they say, go talk to John Smith in this office, you probably don't have them. Uh, or if they say, well, it'd be better if it had this size weapon on it rather than that size weapon, you don't have them. But if they ask you, well, could it also do something else, I think, they now see the potential and it's a lot more, uh, you have a higher probability of success. Um, to, to divert a little bit, a couple of, about 18 months ago, I asked the members on our staff, uh, I, I sent out a question to some of the members on our staff and said, are we in a unique era in history here? Uh, what we're experiencing now with globalization and rise of nations and, uh, you, know, uh, the, you know, changing migration, climate change, on and on. And, and I wanted to see what individuals on our staff said. There's no right or wrong answer. I just wanted to see what people would tell me whether they're thinking about that. And, and um, some people have sent me a note back and said, no, this is unique, we've never experienced this before. And others said, no, it's like this era or that era. But my question uh, made it out to the Naval Postgraduate School and a, a member of the faculty up here named John Arquilla, who has authored a lot of books. The first one, I think, that really had traction was Network, Net Warfare. And, and John brought together a, member, a number of the members of his faculty out at NPS, and they spent a couple days discussing this and they sent me back a uh, six or seven, eight page paper on the topic, which to me has been extremely helpful. And, and they said, 
with all the changes I said, we think the era most common to what we're in today is from the period uh, from 1815 with the fall of Napoleon and the Battle of Waterloo to 1914 and the assassination of Archduke Ferdinand in Sarajevo and the start of basically World War I. And they said that was a period of the rise of nations. Uh, you had uh, Germany uh, come out of the middle of nowhere from uh, 150 or so little city-states. Uh, you had other nations that were struggling. Uh, you had the rise of the United States. Uh, you had the rise of social movements, and social, uh, socialism, you had great migration uh, from places like Ireland. You had globalization, the global trade, uh, uh, and the global communication with uh, telegraph and undersea cables. Uh, you had certainly had an industrial revolution that took, took the world from steam engines at the start of that period, rudimentary steam engines, all the way to, uh, to automobiles, powered flight, communications, submarines, battleships, and all at the end of that period. And so if you step back, in my view, and say, yeah, it, it sounds very similar, and if you take the phrase industrial revolution out and put the phrase information revolution, revolution in, what it, what it tells me is we're in for a heck of a ride for the next hundred years or so. And, and I, think, I, I think that both not only technologically but socially uh, and many other things, and I think the reason I point that out is I think that the velocity of change in terms of both, both global issues and security, economics, integration, as well as the velocity of technology is going to go at a pace that's much, much faster than the, 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 the structures we have now uh, to deal with it, both from uh, the, the development side, uh, from many cases, in my view, the, uh, the, the policy side, and, and also from how society reacts to whatever these changes are. So just, so I, 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 think, I, I think a lot about this, the speed that we're going through and, um, how, once again, it drives me to think about doing things in an iterative kind of fashion and talking about these things in an iterative kind of fashion. As, and as your, as your capability and your technology grows, I think there's a different level of discussion at each level of maturity uh, for the technology or the capability in which it's embedded. Uh, the other thing I'd point out here is, in my view, uh, many people say, well, a lot, you, you should do the, everything comes from the commercial industry or, you know, we have people argue for DOD investment and for me it's a blending of the two together. It's not either or, it, it's a blending of the two. Um, as we talk about and how you talk about technology, again, there's a whole series of different audiences that I think you should consider. Uh, we have a, a uniform military one. Uh, we have defense uh, senior leadership and civilian leadership. Uh, we obviously have a congressional one, and then there's one to the general public. And each of these probably has a different message. For me, the uniform side, one, one, one facet, and there's probably many more. One aspect is obviously military utility. Uh, for senior leadership within the department, probably cost, including procurement, life cycle, risk, time to field are some of the factors. Uh, Congress, I think, thinks about many of the same things, risk, cost, utility, need, and then the general public, I think, value to the taxpayer. And as I said, the messages may change over time with the maturity of the capability. Um, and uh, every one of these new technology areas has to compete with an existing infrastructure and an existing technology. And, and I think when, when I initially thought of this topic, I thought talking technology to the greater public, but I think and as I've suggested a couple times, I think talking internally to the DOD is equally important to parts within the Pentagon. Um, so just to, um, one, of the, one of the things I like to do uh, and I would recommend perhaps is, uh, is, is an exercise that might be accomplished is looking at some of these challenges through a series of case studies, um, both present and past, uh, probably in, in keeping with my idea of going back and saying, is this a unique era we're in? But I think case studies, and I, I suspect, I, I don't have a lot of data on it, but I suspect the introduction of nuclear power in the Navy would be a good one. I, I would guess there was probably a bit of resistance there. Um, I, 
I had a book, I have a book that I read about 10 years ago and I just pulled it out. Uh, it was called Monitor and it's about the story of the USS Monitor in the Civil War and uh, how the Monitor uh, uh, was built and uh, John Erickson was a Swede who built, built it, conceived of it and built it um, against a lot of resistance in the Navy. Uh, his, his, uh, he had, his idea of the monitor, I think, would be developed, probably safe to say, developed over about a 30-year period. It was not something that just came out of nowhere. Uh, the technology was not necessarily an iron ironclad vessel that had been around, but it was the propulsion, the propeller, uh, the gun turret. Uh, this was a ship manned by 58 people with two guns. Uh, compared to larger ships that had many guns and hundreds of people on a crew. And, uh, and it, it fought, as I'm sure most of you know, the, battle, the Monitor and Merrimack in the Civil War. And it, it, the day before the battle between these two ships, the Merrimack had come out, uh, the Confederate ship, and sort of decimated the Navy blockade off the north of Virginia. It was a time when the British and the French were thinking about coming into the Civil War on the side of the South and blockade was key. One of the things they were looking for was cotton. And the next day the Monitor showed up and they fought to a standstill. The blockade was sustained and the French and the British backed out of entering the war. But, and so I'd read this book about 10 years ago and that's kind of what I focused on was, was the historic part and the, the innovations that Erickson put in on this ship. But as I, as I, I picked it up the other day to, in prep, preparation for this and I kind of went through it and the other thing I, I saw, there was a whole series of different audiences that they had to work against to, to do this. Gideon Wells was the Secretary of the Navy. He was very concerned with the, the, the Confederates building this ironclad vessel off the burned out hull of a former U.S. Navy ship. And they had, he felt they had nothing to counter it. Uh, he liked Erickson's idea. There probably was not a soul in the Navy who liked it, in the uniformed Navy. And, uh, and so Wells had to work within the uh, President Lincoln's administration to build support. Um, he had to work on the Hill. Uh, he had to work within the Navy. Uh, and he had to work within industry. And he pulled a, a guy in to do that work for him named um, uh, Cornelius uh, Bushnell from Connecticut. And, and Bushnell was an entrepreneur. I guess Wells did not fancy himself to be a good talker, and so he brought in Bushnell, who was an excellent talker. <laughs> and, uh, and the Navy finally relented, but they wrote all these requirements for the ship. that have to have masts and sails and do this and that and all, all of which Erickson ignored. <laughs> and when it was launched, it had no mast, no nothing. Everybody predicted it would sink when it launched, and it floated to within, I think, like four <laughs> inches of what he had predicted. Uh, so it really was really was a, a nice case study of the various method mes messages that he needed to convey throughout a variety of different audiences. This is Secretary Wells needed to convey. Uh, the other one is, um, I have, uh, first thing I read in the Washington Sunday Post is the comics. I read Doonesbury and there's a, a section in there that some of you have probably seen called Flashbacks and it's on some historic in, in event that took place in the DC area. And there was one a number of years ago on, on the Wright brothers trying to sell an airplane to the Army. And the Army said, oh, we tried that in 1997. It didn't work. We, we don't want to look stupid again. And, and so finally they relented, but they wrote a set of requirements that they would never be able to, he felt, meet. Fly 30 miles an hour for an hour and a half. Be drawn by two, a horse-drawn wagon, things like that. And, and the Wright brothers m finally succeeded, or succeeded, and then they looked at each other and said, well, maybe we ought to buy one of these. And then the question was, well, how do we buy it? It's not in the budget, and so on and so forth. And Teddy Roosevelt apparently had a slush fund as president. <laughs> and they bought it from the slush fund. But once again, uh, you know, 50 years later, 60 years later, where we are in aviation and where we started, a lot of reluctance to talk about the potential of this kind of, kind of device. So for me, uh, some future case studies, uh, one would be cyber. We all understand cyber, we hear about it every day, but I'm not sure that we really understand the magnitude of, of the world of cyber and what's, what's coming down the road. Another one would be uh, synthetic biology and chemistry. 
and a third one I think maybe tied to that, to what I just mentioned, would be human performance, and human performance modification. Uh, we're kind of a physics-based organization in DOD, and so when you start talking about modifying human performance, and by that I mean endurance, strength, learning, uh, we kind of tend to go around that, and I think, I, I think that those are things that are starting to get attention, my view, and uh, we, ought to, we ought to be talking about how do we articulate that, and importantly, as we articulate it, how do we bring along the policies that go with that, um, because there will be policies. So finally, in, in summation, I, th I think the messages vary. And when you talk technology, the messages vary with organization. Um, each organization needs, a, for their level of understanding of where they are within the structure, they need a different type of message. Um, talking about technology as a standalone thing is hard. To me, it's a lot more understandable and a lot more uh, usable if you put it within a context of some, some sort of application. Uh, it, Sec uh, next, it's not only the technology, but the science behind the technology. If you don't have the investments in, in the basic research areas, you're not going to get the technology. And so it's a, it's a continuum from science and research to technology. Uh, I favor an iterative strategy um, that does a lot of different experiments along the way. Uh, one of the one of the demonstrations we sponsored uh, about a year ago, year and a half ago now, was a coordinated exercise between an unmanned undersea vehicle and an unmanned air vehicle. And the unmanned undersea vehicle was kind of guarding an entrance to a harbor, and, the air ve and it would get a contact and it would go back to the air ve vehicle and tell it, go over here and do this. Um, what, what I had hoped we would do is do a series of iterative exercises in that area so in five years we could look back at that first experiment we did and say, boy, was that primitive. But you have to start somewhere and you have to build over time. Uh, the other thing I think is a velocity of change in technology and global events um, that's gonna, I think, challenge our current processes for development and fielding. And then finally, um, a number of years ago, um, I was at the Army War College in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, and I had heard uh, Sir Michael Howard, a British military historian, talk uh, and he said, the only thing harder than putting a new idea in the mind of a military man is taking the old one out. And that sounds funny, it's true, but you have to appreciate the fact that those lessons that that military guy has have often been learned the hard way. And, and so it takes a lot of work to do that. And that quote is actually derived from uh, B.H. Hart, Lydell Hart, uh, who was also a British military historian, and I think comes from about 1930. So whenever anybody comes in and we talk to them and I tell them, well, this will, we'll talk about a technology, and they say, oh, it's no good, it won't work or anything, I often think of Sir Michael Howard and Lydell Hart and that quote, so that's it. Cool. Thanks very much. Um, we have a few minutes for questions, so if people want to raise their hands, I think uh, we'll be coming around with mics. If you could briefly identify yourself and then ask a question, it'd be great. Over here and then over here. Uh, good morning, uh, Tony Bertuca inside the Pentagon. I wanted to ask you a little bit about the the renewed emphasis that this area has taken on over at the building, Mr. Work's third offset initiative, Mr. Kendall's long range R and D investment strategy that's being worked. It seems like this this area now is is really going to get a lot more emphasis. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about you know, your role in those initiatives and if you think it's going to drive, you know, more resources, however large or small they may be, to this area in the near future. Thank well, you. I'm, I'm uh, I don't know if it'll drive resources just because we're broader budgetary things, but I think uh, where we are, our office is in research and engineering, and in my view, uh, we, we are, we did a lot of these JCTDs, joint capability, advanced capability, technology demonstrations. We're shifting more and more toward prototyping and the idea of prototyping. And when Mr. Kendall first brought this idea out, he said uh, one of his big objectives was prototyping focused on uh, you know, peop people in industry, and I would add people within the government, having hand in a period of reduced acquisition, having hands-on experience with systems such as prototyping. 
Uh, the other one was uh, my view, the, but the magic thing he said to me was uh, prototyping not necessarily leading to programs of record. And, uh, or transition maybe it was. I, I don't have the quote exactly right. But in, in my view, uh, a, a lot of the previous programs we did, uh, we would always be graded by, okay, how many of these things transitioned or went to operational use and how many went to programs of record and the like. And, and we'd say 75%. Everybody write 75% down. And nobody ever stopped to say, well, what does that mean? We would just write 75% down. But my, it, my personal view is if you get, if your report card is based on number of things that went to operational use to get a good grade, you're not going to take a lot of risk. Everything becomes kind of mundane. And so when, when Mr. Kendall said that really the objective is hands-on experience, looking at new technologies and all, it gives us a chance to take risk and hopefully fail, not, not hopefully, fail and hopefully not be hauled out on the carpet for failing. That's probably the right, what I wanted to say, if that makes sense. And I favor small things, not large things. That's kind of my, my um, tendency, I guess. Sir? Okay, I'm sorry. Let me, I'm in charge. You in charge? Okay. Over here, and then, sorry, then we'll go over here, and then go here, and then it's probably to keep on schedule, all we'll have time for it, so. For uh, decades, I we've been victims of reverse engineering um, overseas by adversary states. And now, once in a while, adversary states come up with some pretty cool stuff of their own. I think of the Chinese missile, uh, coastal missile, which is launched ballistically and becomes a cruise missile. Uh, potentially against our aircraft carriers, or the Shkval uh, torpedo in Russia. So how good are we at reverse engineering, and how quickly can we field a reverse engineered product? Second, what happens when you're tempted to reverse engineer an allied te technology, a uh, technology that's uh, succeeded in an allied state rather than an adversary? Well, I, I, I can't tell you how good we are at reverse engineering things. It's uh, certainly not an area of expertise, but I would say that uh, we have made within our office a concerted effort to look at what's happening outside of the U.S. in the technology area. Um, and we've done a couple that probably are not pr appropriate for the room, uh, some of who, some of who, which we have demonstrated and deployed, uh, others that we have under evaluation right now. And, and um, as I'm sure you say, people say quite often, you know, it's foolhardy to not look at technologies in other parts of the world, and we have, we have hands-on experience with that. I, I'd also say that um, I, I think that we have been involved in a lot more active engagement with um, some of our long-term term allies and others, and we're looking for more in overseas engagement. So. Let's go right here, and then, I can, and, and then over there, and then we'll have to take a break. Thank you for your talk today. Um, I was wondering if you see or the Department of Defense sees an a interaction between intellectual property and national security. I, I would say, yeah, sure. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's <laughs> yeah okay, that, that's good. Uh, are, are we aware that the uh, American patent system is under attack right now? Um, it's. I am, but it's beyond the scope of what I do, yes. Okay. Yeah. Uh, talk on it How do you think that's going to uh, impact our uh, uh, small, private, personal innovators, the people that actually have innovated in the past the biggest I inventions that we've come up with? Which is that a question or what? Would well, we have independent inventors. Sure. Corporations right. uh, have rarely right. come up with breakthrough right. inventions, if ever. Uh, but right now, we are not offering uh, patent protection for those small independent inventors. And they will not be able to invent because they and, and prototype because they cannot get investment money because they can't get a patent on software. I could, uh, uh, we've, we've worked in that, some of that area. Um, it's not an area we work, but we've worked in it, and frankly, 
and my part is to stir the discussion on, on some of that. And we, we, do a, uh, we do work with a number of small inventors like that. Uh, the idea being uh, helping them develop ways, not, not with their IP, but more develop ways to protect their, their product or their idea from mainly cyber attack in an affordable manner. I could talk to you more about it, but those are things that we're aware of. I had one last question right here. I'm going to try to stay on. I don't want to get totally off base at right at the beginning. <laughs> so Morning. that's hilarious. Boomer Smith from Noetic Corporation. You've largely answered my question with the two previous ones, but just uh, a, a tangent on that. Are you seeing any evidence that uh, the, the need to uh, either protect a technological edge in which the US is investing or alternatively to, to offset a technological edge that another country might be gaining is actually changing the way in which the US relates to different countries. For example, you've, you've referred to the way you're benchmarking to some extent and studying what other people are doing. That obviously works very well within the Five Eyes community uh, at best, but there are many other countries that have got coming up with smart ideas. I, is the US changing the way it relates to countries or potentially change the way it relates to countries in either order to protect its own technology or to well, gain, gain access to others? We're looking at, in DOD, looking at particularly cyber protection amongst all contractors. Um, we have, again, an, an effort in this area. I would call it, uh, it's, again, it's not an area that I, our office has direct responsibility in, but I'm trying to demonstrate some things to get other parts of the department to look at what we're doing. I, I think the answer is yes to your question. Okay. Uh, ben, thanks so much for mm -hmm taking the time, uh, we very much appreciate it. Uh, hopefully, I think you've set the stage very well for um, the next two panels, which are designed to uh, first offer some perspectives on, uh, from some of the audiences that you mentioned and their observations about things that uh, work well and maybe not so well, and then um, the flip side of, of various stakeholders in the, on the producer side of the equation uh, will, will offer their views on, uh, on how, to, how to do this effectively. So again, thanks for taking the time. I appreciate your uh, you. experience and continued efforts. And so if people want to go out and grab a cup of coffee before we come back in, we'll uh, continue the march on towards lunch and look forward to seeing you back here shortly.